Hello everyone, it's good to see you here today, that even though there was a bit of snow today that you still made it and uh, came uh, all the way here, that's really great. My name is Hanna van den Bos. I'm a program maker and creator for Studium Generale. We organize all kinds of uh, events like this one, um, on events and on uh, topics that matter. So now uh, to today's topic online haters and why internet discussions escalate. Um, I think maybe, you know, you know this when you go to a comment section of uh, a YouTube video or on Twitter or uh, maybe a news article. It can get a bit rough there in the comment section. Sometimes you see a lot of fighting, lots of swearing as well. But why is that? Why do um, discussions online tend to escalate more quickly than when you meet someone in person? It's an interesting question, I think. Someone who can tell us more about this is uh, Carla Rose. She is an assistant professor at the Department of um, Communication, right? Here at Tilburg University. And she has a PhD in social psychology. Her other research in expertise is uh, focused on online discussions and also the behavior uh, in interaction partners. So please give a big applause for Carla Rose. So, uh, yes, uh, I will just start by saying that, yeah, this topic of uh, online discussions was the topic of my PhD uh, research, which I conducted in Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, and which I recently uh, completed in September, so it's quite fresh uh, research. Um, and I'm currently also still uh, working on developing this further, so if you're interested, let me know uh, to maybe discuss further. Um, and today I will talk to you about yeah, why do online discussions tend to escalate more easily than face-to-face -face discussions. And my talk will be quite uh, scientific uh, because I understood that you are mostly uh, yeah, students here at the university or somewhere else at the university. So uh, also when something is not clear, please let me know. Uh, you can also just raise your hand during my talk and I can try to elaborate a little bit more or explain something when something is unclear. So feel free to also raise your hands during the presentation. So let's start. So, as we already said uh, multiple times now, we see that uh, uh, discussions seem to uh, be more prone to escalate in misunderstanding and conflict when they are conducted via uh, uh, online media and mostly textual media as compared to when uh, people discuss face to face. Um, and this raises two interrelated questions. So first of all, why, why happen, does this happen? What, why, uh, yeah, what is causing this uh, online escalation? And secondly, uh, building on this, when we learn what can uh, explain this online escalation, maybe we can also learn how to solve it or prevent it. Um, and according to these two questions, my talk will also be separated in two uh, blocks. So the first uh, part will be about why does online escalate, so our research about that. And secondly, how we can uh, maybe prevent or reduce this online escalation. But first, uh, I want to learn uh, your ideas about uh, why online discussions escalate. No direct consequences. Okay. People can wear masks and are able to share their frustrations with less risk of long-lasting tension. So that's probably what this anonymity is causing. So no accountability. Consequences of your actions are not direct. You don't see the reaction of your comment to the other person. So maybe it's less hurtful. Problems on others. Yeah, okay. So I see a lot of, yeah, not real contact, anonymity, people not feeling accountable, people not maybe feeling emotional connections, maybe feeling that they can do whatever they want because they are anonymous. So thank you for this input. Um, so I think <laughs> I will just continue uh, to with the rest of the talk. So thank you for your input. Um, so this is nice because it also ties into uh, one of the common explanations that we often hear for online escalation. Um, I have two, so I will start with the other one. 
Oh no, I will start with this one. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So this is tying into what you also mentioned. So it's often thought that because people are often anonymous in many online uh, discussion places, that they feel that they can say whatever they want without any consequences for uh, their uh, impression management. So they feel they can uh, start to call names uh, or say offensive language without any consequences. Um, uh, and this is formalized in the online disinhibition effect. So it's also often written about in the literature. And second of all, it is often assumed that people, um, when they are expressing themselves in text, are less clear because they cannot use their body language like gesturing or smiling, uh, so no facial expressions as well. And this will then lead to more misunderstandings and this can maybe escalate into conflict. Um, and this is also uh, visible in the literature. Um, so we hear it, people uh, in, in uh, popular opinions, but also in the literature, uh, in the media richness theory. Um, but then, um, yeah, when we look at this, these sort of explanations and then literature more broadly, we can uh, summarize this as, uh, as follows. So it is often assumed that uh, the medium characteristics, so text-based, for example, will change people's psychology. And therefore, this will change their behavior. So in the example of the uh, disinhibition effect, so it is often assumed that when people are anonymous, they become less concerned with being positively evaluated by others or be, be less concerned with others in general. And therefore, they will start to act differently. So they will um, do whatever they want, whatever they feel like, and this can result in disinhibited behavior. Uh, and maybe take on a toxic form when there's this uh, controversial discussion going on. Um, so often this uh, line of reasoning is assumed. But we um, propose that maybe it can also be the other way around. So uh, we assume that um, when people go online, they might not necessarily change psychologically speaking. Um, and like maybe they don't, do not become disinhibited. Um, but we thought that what does change when you are uh, communicating online is also your behavior. So people's behavior is limited, maybe, online. And this can have social psychological consequences. And I will explain more about this uh, later. But we first need to know, um, we first need to look at behavior. Because uh, we saw that uh, discussions when they are held online tend to escalate more easily than when they are held offline. Right? So what might be informative is to look at what people do actually in offline conversations to see uh, how they dare manage their disagreements without escalation. Because when we see behaviors that people do offline, uh, we can also maybe think that or see that certain of those behaviors are not possible online, which might then uh, explain this escalation. Um, so how do people deal with disagreements face to face? Uh, and there's two important behaviors uh, distinguished here. So first of all, uh, responsiveness. So this is defined as the degree to which interaction partners provide each other with instant feedback. Uh, so for example, uh, you might notice it yourself as well. When you are having a discussion with somebody and this, uh, you want to show that you are listening to this person, you start to nod or say mm-hmm or yes. So you're responding to the other person in essence. Um, and in this way, you show that you are listening and engaged in a conversation and also interested in, in what they want to say. And maybe also show some kind of understanding that you uh, see what, where they are going. Um, and secondly, uh, uh, what people often do when they have a, a controversial discussion, they tend to express this, um, uh, their disagreements in a very ten tentative manner. So they, uh, instead of being very direct, people start to use a lot of hesitations, hedges and qualifiers. So they will say like, um, I sort of agree with you, but I also not totally agree with you maybe because on the other hand, right, and like very fake, just a lot of words uh, without much content. Um, so in this way, they show that they are maybe still a bit uncertain about their opinion and can also still maybe be convinced of another opinion, which leaves room for different opinions to be brought up in a discussion. And secondly, they also show with this ambiguity and tentativeness that they don't want to offend the other person. So they want to maintain good social relationships. Um, and because this ambiguity might still be a little bit ambiguous to you, I also included a, an example of, of this. So this is an example of a real face-to-face -face comment uh, made by one of the participants in one of our studies. So the opinion is not that clear. 
Uh, and I also um, red marked all the expressions that I saw that indicated this, yes, this doubt and, and uh, ambiguity. So not really a little bit, um, so qualifying a lot and also uh, saying a lot maybe and or so uh, and say and um. So all those little um, yeah, words and expressions that show this uh, ambiguity. And people do this really a lot. So when, you, when I listen to the recordings of the face-to-face uh, -face discussions, it seems very natural. But when you write it down on, on text, you see just how much people do it. And then it seems quite strange, actually. Um, but yeah, it has a function. So uh, when we come back to those two behaviors, this responsiveness and ambiguity, uh, we term them uh, diplomatic behaviors. Um, because these behaviors enable people to have a discussion about a difficult topic, on which they disagree, maybe, without damaging their relationship. So they can be diplomatic in this way. Um, and then this makes us wonder, because when uh, these behaviors are so important to maintain this good discussion face-to-face, -face, maybe uh, people are limited in these behaviors online, and this can then explain why online might escalate. So that is what we proposed, not very coincidentally. Um, so we proposed that, um, now again you see the model that we proposed, right? So first the, the medium changes behavior which changes psychology. So we proposed that um, two of the characteristics that differentiate uh, online from face-to-face -face discussions will uh, limit people's ability to be uh, diplomatic, to be responsive and to be, to be uh, ambiguous. So first of all, uh, many online media are asynchronous, so uh, responses occur with long delays or people are maybe also entering messages at the same time, uh, by which it becomes like cross-talking a little bit. Um, and this uh, then reduces responsiveness. Uh, and second of all, uh, a lot of uh, online uh, media are text-based, so people are expressing their opinions only in text. And, and this will probably make the expression less ambiguous. Um, people might be more likely to say, I disagree, rather than this slide filling example that we just saw. That's, that's a lot of typing work, that people don't do that. Um, and then, because responsiveness and ambiguity are so important in face-to-face -face discussions to maintain this sense of agreement and good social relationships, uh, we thought that this lack of responsiveness and lack of ambiguity in online discussions will explain uh, why people experience less agreement and less harmony, so uh, a worse relationship in essence. And then as a, a sort of an underlying process for this, uh, we thought this might be related to experiences of uh, feeling ignored in the online uh, conversation because your partners are not responding to you. And second of all, also because maybe people think that others are disinhibited and not uh, being concerned with them because they are uh, not responding to them and also uh, expressing themselves very clearly, which might come across as very opinionated and not very uh, socially concerned. So this is what we expected. Um, and we uh, tested this uh, in a couple of studies, um, uh, two of which uh, had this uh, how do we say, design. Uh, so here we had uh, students come into the lab in, in small groups of three or four and discuss about uh, controversial topics uh, like the refugee crisis uh, or so. Um, and they were unacquainted, so they didn't know each other before, which is quite important when you want to assess relationships, evaluation, uh, etc. Uh, and they had discussions uh, both via text-based online chats and face-to-face. -face. Um, and in the second study, we also had a, a confederate come into the lab, uh, an actress, uh, and that was also participating in this discussion without the participants knowing. So they were just, one of them was actually with me, and she was uh, pretending to be a quite a right-wing uh, student with a quite a strong opinion. Uh, so, uh, and the other students were mostly left-wing. So we tried to get a little bit more of, of uh, yeah, controversy and, and disagreement in this sense. Um, and I will uh, also present the results of this second study uh, shortly. Uh, but in both conversations we then, uh, or in both studies, we then looked very closely at behavior. So what do people do and how do they express themselves? And we also asked them about their uh, experiences of this conversation and about their uh, evaluations of each other uh, in, in questionnaires. Um, yeah, so on to the results. First of all, for, for the behavior, 
um, the first block we are interested in is that we indeed saw in line with what we expected that people were less responsive in the chat conversations and in the face-to-face -face conversations. So there was more of this cross-talking um, and people were not responding to each other that much as they did face-to-face. -face. Um, and we also saw that the online chat messages were way less ambiguous than face-to-face -face messages. So people express themselves with way less hesitations and hedges and qualifiers than in the face-to-face -face comments. Um, and what is interesting as well is that we uh, didn't encounter any sign of disinhibited behavior. So we didn't see people calling names or being aggressive, which is maybe not very uh, surprising because it were just students having a conversation in a lab for study points or so. So they were probably motivated to keep a nice conversation. But indeed, we saw no disinhibited behavior. Um, so, in line with what we expected, uh, we see that indeed online messages are less responsive. Uh, so, people in this discussion are less responsive to each other and also there's less ambiguity in their messages. So, how will people experience this behavior? Was the second question. So, what is the psychological change? So here we saw that um, when they engaged in, a, in a, a chat conversation, people felt more ignored than in a face-to-face -face conversation. And also that they perceived each other as disinhibited, more disinhibited than in the face-to-face -face conversations. And this last thing is extra interesting because we just saw that most, yeah, so there was no a proof of this, of this inhibited behavior in the, in the content of the conversations. But still people thought their partners were more disinhibited than in the face-to-face -face conversations. And also, they didn't consider themselves to be disinhibited online. So this is quite interesting. Apparently, something happens within these discussions that makes people think that their partners are disinhibited while they are actually not, or while they think they are not, and while, while they are also not behaving in this way. Um, so that is also uh, supporting uh, our uh, expectations that People will feel more ignored in these online discussions than in the face-to-face -face discussions and also uh, perceive each other as disinhibited. And then lastly, um, we also looked at uh, how this affects people's sense of agreement and uh, social relationships, so harmony. And we also saw that people felt less uh, agreement in the chats than in the face-to-face -face conversation, also less harmony. So they experienced um, less identification uh, between each other after the chat conversations. Um, and for the agreement, it's actually interesting that we also looked uh, at, uh, when we looked at the uh, actual opinions of interaction partners, we didn't see that they were more disagreeing uh, with each other. So when we measured their private opinions on the disc uh, discussion statement, these were not um, more different than in the face-to-face uh, -face discussion. So there was not actually more disagreement in the chats, but still people perceived more disagreement in the chats than in the face-to-face -face conversations. Um, but in general, we find uh, support for, for our model that there's less uh, agreement and less harmony experience online. Um, so, and yeah, because we expected that these um, behaviors, this uh, less responsiveness and less ambiguity will uh, yeah, lead to uh, or be related to this uh, perceived ignoring and disinhibition, etc. We also looked at the correlations between these um, concepts uh, and these were in line with expectations in that we just see that um, people experience, so while they do not actually uh, disagree more, they do experience more disagreement in the chat conversations because they express themselves less responsiveness, uh, less responsively uh, and less ambiguously. Uh, and this less responsiveness and less ambiguity leads to feeling ignored and disinhibited. So um, there's in, in a way um, these behaviors, so this lack of these diplomatic behaviors seems to lead to all kinds of uh, misperceptions and misattributions. So people um, while they are not disinhibited, they think that their partners are disinhibited because they are just expressing themselves so clearly and not very responsiveness, responsively. Uh, and also, while they are not actually disagreeing more, they experience this disagreement because they are having this discussion in which everybody is expressing themselves so clearly, uh, opinions so clearly and uh, so little responsively. Um, so in, in effect, we see that the medium actually changes behavior, but people seem to uh, attribute this behavior change to each other's intentions instead. And that can have consequences. 
So this brings me to the, the conclusion slide of the first part. So we, the first question was why does online seem to escalate more easily than offline conversations? So uh, first of all, uh, we saw that it's often expected that this is due to uh, online messages being uh, ambiguous or fake, unclear, uh, and, and or that this was due to uh, people being disinhibited online because they are anonymous anyway. But we found that also the opposite can be the case. So we, we saw that when we look actually at behavior, we see that online uh, comments are actually uh, more clear than face-to-face -face, uh, comments. And that this clarity can lead to misperceptions of disinhibition uh, in others. Uh, and, and make people think they disagree more. So we see that the medium uh, seems to make people less able to be diplomatic, but that people misattribute this lack of diplomacy to each other's yeah, sort of asocial motivations. So is this clear until now? Mm -hmm. Uh, so what do you think makes the difference whether the online exp expression is too clear or too vague? Do you think it's de it depends on the context of the discussion? For example, when um, a discussion is about, for example, uh, refugee crisis, yeah. um, do you think when people express themselves too clearly instead of getting into these, amb these ambiguous expressions that's, that, that, that's more... Uh, enhanced face-to-face, -face. Mm -hmm. do you think that it's, it, it's easier in this context? Uh, easier in the online context or easier in the context of the topic? or In the online context. Yeah, now, uh, so we saw that, or yeah, I think, and we also saw that uh, in the online uh, discussions it's more difficult to be ambiguous. Um, you could do it, you could also type um and maybe and or so, but yeah, it's not just not what people do. So in that sense, uh, it's more difficult. Do you understand or is it answering your question as well? Or? My question was actually about the context. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, so uh, for, for example, or for example, COVID. Yeah. Whether COVID is real or when, whether people are, uh, are too clear in, for example, uh, stating data <clears throat> from previous research uh, from previous research about COVID yeah. and other people still doubting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good point. Uh, the context in general is, of course, very important here because where we are looking at here uh, is uh, at controversial topics, discussions about controversial topics. Because when you um, so in that in that sense, then uh, ambiguity is nice because then it leaves more room to have different opinions uh, and disagree with each other in a harmonious way. But when you are uh, having a, a discussion or a conversation about something about which you completely agree, then it would be preferable to say I completely agree in a very clear manner. Because when you would then say I uh, maybe sort of agree, then it makes it probably less convincing that you actually agree. So it really depends on what you're discussing. And here we are uh, looking at yeah, controversial topics. So in that uh, way, it's really in important indeed, the context. Yeah, thank you. So, um, but yeah, we looked at why uh, online uh, escalation uh, happens. But then this can bring us to uh, how we might uh, be able to maybe prevent or reduce online escalation. That would be nice, right? So maybe we can use all this knowledge that we uh, gathered until now and try to maybe uh, make online uh, a better place. So we thought, based on our research, to try to increase these diplomatic behaviors in the online conversations. So maybe this will help to make them more harmonious. So maybe I can, we can find a way to increase ambiguity and increase responsiveness in textual chats. Uh, and this we did in a quite of a creative way uh, by uh, transcribing face-to-face uh, -face, uh, and online discussions that we collected in the previous study. Uh, we took these uh, uh, conversations and we put them all in the format of a textual chat. So we had uh, half of the conversations were actually were already, already uh, original textual chats, so we remained them in the same manner. But we also took the face-to-face -face conversations and put them uh, in the format of a textual chat. So we transcribed them uh, and also gave usernames, so as you can see here as well. Uh, so 
this is actually an original face-to-face -face conversation that, that we made appear as if it is a, an online chat conversation. And we did this uh, in order to try to increase the ambiguity and increase the responsiveness, because we saw in the face-to-face -face, uh, conversations that there is more responsiveness and ambiguity. Uh, so we, yeah, in a way, we uh, inserted ambiguity and responsiveness in these textual chats. But we also had the original textual chats to compare, right? Uh, and then we had um, a group of uh, uninformed observers to evaluate these uh, uh, discussions. So the online, original online discussions and the original face-to-face -face discussions. And these people thought these were all original chat discussions, all original online conversations. And we asked them to say, um, to see... Uh, to what extent they saw these diplomatic behaviors, to what extent they thought these were responsive and amb ambiguous, and we also asked them uh, to what extent they thought these people in these conversations were yeah, having a good relationship and uh, being in agreement with each other. Um, and that gave the following results. So, um, in line with what we would expect based on the previous, we saw that uh, the more responsive these observers thought that the chatters were, the more they thought these chatters were having agreement, being in agreement, and having good social relationships. So that's in line with what we would expect. But contrary to expectations, so completely the other way around, was the effect of ambiguity. So we saw that the more ambiguous the observers thought that the chatters were, the less agreement and the less social harmony they observed there to be in this chat context. So this, complete, this is the complete opposite of what we found before. Before we saw in the face-to-face -face context that ambiguity helped to make the conversation more harmonious and agreeing. But in this chat context, it seems that maybe this ambiguity is perceived as a bit yeah, weird or unfitting. Um, and maybe when we think back to this uh, previous slide with this long comment that was original face-to-face, you, you can also maybe recognize why it might not have worked. Because this ambiguity can also just seem very unnatural in this textual format. So maybe that was going on. So we can see uh, or conclude that so responsiveness might work, but this face-to-face -face ambiguity might be a bit weird online. Um, and that made me thought for... Yeah, maybe we can find another way uh, to make uh, online more ambiguous in a way that is more fitting to the online medium, to the textual medium. So uh, instead of inserting this face-to-face -face ambiguity with um and maybe and or so, maybe we can find something that is more natural online. Um, so then when we think back about the functions of uh, ambiguity, um, I was talking about uh, that it can increase perceptions that people are yeah, uh, still doubting their opinion, that they are not, not certain yet, so which leaves room for more opinions to exist. And secondly, also that it uh, allows people to, um, to show that they are trying to take the other person into account, that they don't want to offend the other person. And then I was thinking that maybe another way to do this is simple as this, maybe expressing your opinion as an opinion uh, can also accomplish this as compared to expressing your opinion as a fact. Because when we looked at the online discussions, a lot of people were just um, presenting their opinion as if it was a fact. Like, that is not true. That's not the case. Um, while in the face-to-face -face conversations, there were more, more of those uh, statements of I think and uh, in my opinion, etc. So I thought maybe this very minimal um, manipulation can also work. Uh, and this is very uh, preliminar preliminary data, that's a difficult word, um, so uh, keep silent about this. <laughs> it still needs to be replicated, uh, but I'm doing that now. So in this study, um, which is really recent, uh, we had uh, participants read fake news uh, articles from nu.nl. That's an online a news uh, site, a website thing, where people can also discuss uh, about the news article in the comment section below it. Um, so we made fake news articles uh, with fake discussion sections underneath them and we had uh, participants uh, evaluate these discussions and um, we had two conditions. So in one condition uh, the participants read the discussion section where uh, all the discussing people or all the discussants were using uh, words like I think and in my opinion etc. That was one condition, the I think uh, and the opinion as opinion condition. And the opinion as fact condition, all these words were gone. 
So there was no, uh, in my opinion, or uh, according to my thoughts or so. So that was all just gone. Um, and then we asked them whether they thought these people were having uh, agreement, where they were being in agreement, and whether they were having a good relationship, and also whether they would themselves feel yeah, prone to also participate in this discussion. Um, and I have two uh, examples of the stimuli we used for both conditions, so maybe you can tell me which one is which. The first one, <laughs> that's the opinion as opinion. So uh, there we included those statements in, in my opinion, and I've heard enough. Uh, uh, I always think, so it's very uh, sort of personal, so it's just my experience and my opinion. And here it's just gone. So the comment is also a little bit shorter. That's a limitation, of course. But still, the difference, there's no uh, any more, uh, no other differences. So this is the only difference. Um, so and then to the results. Uh, so we saw uh, that this manipulation was effective. So um, we see that when people read uh, a comment section where everybody expresses their opinion as if, as if it is a fact, so without statements like, I think, <coughs> they perceive less agreement uh, between the uh, interaction partners and also less harmony in this discussion. Um, and that's interesting because, as you saw, the only difference between these two conditions was these little sentences of I think and uh, in my opinion. Um, and also, uh, as a consequence of, of this perceiving this agreement um, uh, and, and harmony, people felt also more likely to uh, join when they read a discussion that was uh, where everybody expressed their opinion as an opinion. So it also seemed to create a more of a, yeah, a pleasant space to also participate in the discussion. Um, yeah, so that brings me to the conclusion also of the second part of the lecture. So uh, we first looked at, yeah, why can we, why, why, why uh, does online es escalate more easily than face-to-face? And so we saw that that was due to uh, lacking responsiveness and lacking ambiguity, so these diplomatic behaviors, which can lead to misperceptions uh, of uh, disinhibition and disagreement. Uh, and then we looked in the second part at how uh, we might improve online discussions based on this knowledge. So we saw that by inserting responsiveness from a face-to-face -face conversation in a text chat, that might help to make it seem more, uh, more harmonious and, and nice. Um, but inserting uh, ambiguity of the face-to-face -face type uh, was not very effective. That was a bit weird. But then expressing one's opinion as an opinion seems to be a, a viable alternative for this. Um, and because you're here also maybe to, to maybe get some uh, uh, things, tips to, to go home, right? To also maybe improve your own uh, online life. Uh, I also included some uh, take-home tips for how to maybe behave in, a, in a online discussions next time you engage. Uh, so how can we improve uh, online discussions? And first of all, I think it's very important uh, that you think before you, you act. Of course, it's always important, but especially here, because we saw that there can be a lot of uh, misunderstandings uh, between people. So uh, maybe uh, the, the person you meet online and that seems so aggressive and antisocial, maybe this person uh, is not uh, intending to behave in this way, but is just limited in their behavior by the medium. Um, and then secondly, yeah, always uh, try to be responsive when you uh, react to a, an online message. So try to acknowledge the previous uh, post that you say like, ah, yes, uh, but, or so that you make a connection to, to a previous statement. Um, and lastly, uh, yeah, maybe express your opinion as an opinion uh, rather than as a fixed fact might also help. So. That was uh, my presentation. And these are my dear collaborators, my uh, pr promoters. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> are there any questions? Yes. Then please raise your hand if you have a question. No? You have a question? <laughs> I was wondering to what extent the format or the platform mm -hmm. where the discussion takes place has influence on um, the tone of voice and the expressions that you just told about. Mm -hmm. And do you do you uh, so, sorry? Can I ask something more? Do you have some expectations about this? What can well, happen? What might matter? For example, on Reddit, uh, text seems to be more. Um, 
I took five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Longer or so. Yeah, more yeah. elaborate. And on Discord, where there is a certain community, people can have short text or maybe on Facebook, short comments or mm -hmm. preferred over long comments. Did you see anything on that? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we didn't uh, study this. Uh, but I can imagine that when you're limited in the text you can use, it becomes even more clear. So that might lead to even more escalation. So I, I know on Twitter you have to be very short. So maybe that can contribute, I'm not sure. But it is funny because we also, we did look at uh, Reddit comments, but then just at Reddit comments and not comparing it to others. Um, but there we saw especially that people uh, didn't really react to each other. So there was um, maybe somebody started to talk about uh, COVID and then uh, also that um, their, their mother was in the hospital or so. And then uh, somebody else reacted to that by asking, uh, by, by talking about the hospital or so. Like, oh yeah, this hospital is shit or something like that. So they just uh, seem to be taking uh, elements from each other's messages to react to. So to take the other person's comment as an excuse to say what they wanted to say anyway. So this can also maybe make people feel very ignored and yeah, not really heard. So yeah, that's interesting as well. But uh, thank you for your question. <laughs> All right, in any back. others? I see one in the back. Just a second. Hi, um, so I have, uh, I actually have two questions, but my mm -hmm. first would be, um, so in your research, did you um, kind of like explore different um, places on the internet and how they differ per levels of what I would say toxicity because I've noticed that the way that for instance to bring it on myself that I interact on Twitter is probably a lot more different than I would interact on say Reddit or another mm -hmm. social media platform and so I, I then begin to think that maybe some places kind of harbor a particular kind of behavior yeah. where you're like okay the area the, like the you're on twitter so therefore you're more combative for mm -hmm, instance mm -hmm, yeah and so like i was just wondering if you've looked into different uh, um, places yeah it's a good question um yeah we also didn't study this uh, but uh, this um it is known in literature that uh certain platforms can have certain norms social norms and this, uh, so how to how people tend to behave in these places. So um, what we did look at in Reddit is different uh, subreddits that have di also different norms. So there are subreddits where, where people are uh, uh, know they can be quite uh, aggressive or so. That's like the accepted way to to act to be very uh, um, yeah aggressive in your language use. And others where people are trying to be very constructive in their discussions. So there's different norms that also steer behavior indeed. And also uh, these norms might also dictate uh, the consequences of this behavior. Because when you expect to be in a place where everybody is calling names and being aggressive, etc. Maybe this is also less hurtful. Because you think like, oh yeah, that's the expected behavior and this is how we do here, right? So this is actually a very important uh, factor to also take into account. Yeah. And um, just my second question was, um, so during the actual experiment, um, were there, like, what were your limitations, I'd say? Like, what did you feel like maybe you could have done better or to give, you know, more, in, like, uh, more insightful, like, results or something? Because, like, for instance, from my perspective, I was like, I found it really interesting that you got a, um, like, for instance, an actor to be, kind yeah. of like an instigator, right? Um, but then I would wonder like, what if uh, you kind of like interviewed people prior and knew where they stood on like a, on a political spectrum and then like put those two people together yeah. for a more organic kind of like thing. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a good, good point as well. Yeah, yeah, and we indeed uh, introduced this uh, confederate because we noticed in the first discussion uh, or in the first uh, study that people were not very strongly opinionated and not really disagreeing about the topics. But uh, I, in the first study, I also tried to uh, select uh, uh, discussion topics that were controversial uh, among students. So we did pilot test them, etc. And we also uh, try to indeed put people together with different opinions. But still people were a bit like, yeah, we are just here for, for the assignment and the, and the study points. Um, so then we had this confederate to get a little bit more, uh, yeah, I don't know, yeah, controversiality. 
Um, but then, of course, a very big limitation of uh, all uh, lab studies is that it is a lab study. <laughs> so it's quite, uh, uh, it's not how, how real life might be, or it's like a condensed sort of way uh, to look at it. So um, it's still the ecological validity is limited. So therefore, we need to look uh, indeed also in these real online discussions and what happens there. But that's can be quite hard as well, because there, there then you don't know about how people feel. So I would like to know how uh, somebody might feel when they uh, have these online discussions on, on Reddit or so. But it, the, the thing is that it's very hard to find those people and interview them then. You can just observe their behavior with no consequences or no psychological consequences. So yeah, that all has um, I don't know, advantages and disadvantages. So yeah. Thank you for the questions. Are there any other Here's questions, another. maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I first, I would like to be clarified which were the age groups in, in these two studies that you conducted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. oh, which, which age groups are? Yeah, well, I think the first study, there were like students yeah. or something. And in the second study? Also, yeah. Also students. Because I have a question. Do you think that your results are generalizable for the general population? And if not, which are your hypotheses or I better say expectations of implementing yeah. your studies to different age groups? Yeah. Yeah, it's also a very good question. And also a limitation of the studies that we looked only at this uh, younger age group. Um, but I think that these are uh, more general uh, processes. Um, at least for the uh, diplomatic behaviors, we see that, yeah, in the literature that people often, yeah, are responsive and uh, ambiguous as well uh, in uh, offline conversations. So we know that. Um, and I also think that the consequences of, of this behavior lacking might be still uh, hurtful also in older generations. Um, but it might be uh, less or, uh, or more pronounced for certain age groups. And then I'm also thinking about uh, yeah, something that might be a little bit related to, to norms or so, so that you have maybe um, yeah, related to expectations. So older people might be more used to, um, yeah, to offline uh, 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 conversations. So maybe they might be yeah, less understanding that the online medium can change behavior and feel even more hurt. Uh, or not, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, so I find it hard to um, to think of about how it might be different. Can go both ways for my uh, feeling, but I'm not sure whether you have uh, another hypothesis. <laughs> I personally think that younger, like students like us, mm -hmm. are more prone for a conversation yeah. because. Um, I, I, I might get into another field of uh, nostalgia and stuff, but things uh, things are very different nowadays. We we have already encountered conversation in social media about difficult com, com, uh, like topics, yeah. and um, yeah. So that's that's why I think in like older gr age groups are more hesitant. Um, uh, this is, but this is my own um, uh, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so yeah, yeah, I think that's yeah. But when you think about, uh, I'm not sure whether you mean with hesitant also the, the ambiguity uh, side of it, because <clears throat> when I'm now thinking about uh, when I uh, send WhatsApp messages to my mother, she is quite clear, and sometimes I feel a bit like, oh, is she uh, angry or so a little bit? So she also is less, um, yeah, I don't know practiced in maybe adapting a little bit to the medium, apparently. So at least I also try to maybe include some emojis or uh, just try to include some happy words or so, not just clear and then with a, with a dot at, at the end. Uh, so maybe also uh, having this limited experience might also make them appear even more disinhibited or angry or so. So yeah, that could also uh, happen, I think. Yeah, good question. There's one more here. <laughs> I just, I, I thought of something related to what he said. Um, I think older people tend to be more settled in their opinion, especially when you look at like the age group that is now about 18, so Gen Z. They, 
are more likely to listen to input from other people, at least in my experience, that might be my corner of their internet chiming mm -hmm. in. But I, in my experience, adults are, or older adults are very settled in their opinions and their thoughts and they don't listen to changes and then accept them, mm -hmm. um, which I think might also make them, if they are adapt in their uh, abilities in online discussions, make them more um, disinhibited mm -hmm. or make them appear more disinhibited because they are so settled and they do, yeah. do that thing of like stating opinions as facts because mm -hmm. to them it is a fact, mm -hmm. it is not an mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, might be uh, yeah going on. Interesting. Thank you. All right. Any others? Yeah. Um, so I had a little bit of a question I thought of when you were showing the take home points. Uh, you mentioned limitations of medium. Yeah. And I was wondering, uh, so both of your studies kind of focus on variables that are more language focused, like ambiguity in terms of Oh, I think, or mm -hmm. stuff like that, and responsiveness, which is also more like the actual words. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what you thought about tone, because often when you, usually online conversations are text-based, and it's very difficult to deduce the tone yeah. someone's talking in, yeah. especially because we all have different text styles, and if you're trying to interpret someone's message just based on how you type, it sometimes it's vague that way so i want i'm just wondering what you think because i can imagine misinterpreting someone's tone can easily escalate a conversation because mm -hmm. you just think yeah. they mean something different yeah yeah i think yeah that certainly can happen indeed um so uh yeah uh, this was also something i was struggling with when i wanted to uh do these studies because we did something that's a little bit maybe weird in a way in that we compared to very different media. So we compared uh, offline with online. This is like a world of a difference. Um, and many things that uh, uh, could be coded in an uh, offline conversation, such as facial expressions or tone of voice or all these nonverbal things that are by definition not present online. So I couldn't, yeah, when I would code it, it was zero or so. So then you don't have any variants you could work with. So. Yeah, in that way, I, I decided for now to leave that out. But certainly it will be very important when you uh, indeed smile with your message or uh, say it in, a, in a, a happy tone or so, or maybe a little bit like a questionable tone or so, like, mm, I'm not sure, something like that. So that, that will definitely have a huge effect. Yeah, very good point. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. Um, any other sets that want to add something? I don't think so. All right. Then I uh, would like to thank you, uh, Carla. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very inter interesting to see this overview and also, um, yeah, see the research that you have done. I think uh, I learned a lot, so uh, that's, uh, that's good. Thank you. And also thank you for all your uh, very engaging questions. That's always nice when you, uh, um, yeah, when you think of that. So uh, thank you for the, uh, the audience as well. Uh, please, again, a very uh, big applause for Carla Rose. Thank you as well.